and um, I'll move forward from here. Father, I thank you that you have given us so much. And I just pray that from what we have, the abundance on this earth and here in Beachboro, Perth. Lord, I just pray that you continue to bless us as you have continuously blessed. And we thank you for the blessings that you bring. Lord, I just pray that as I open my mouth today, that your Holy Spirit will speak words that will be real to people, that will set um, our hearts in a, in a direction that gives us what to do this year and where to go from here. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last weekend, we had uh, an elders retreat. And so um, one of the good things about that is working through your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities and your threats. And partway through that, we were halfway through the uh, weaknesses and I felt a bit depressed. <laughs> I said to Richard, no more, let's just rattle us on and speed it up. We don't like looking at our weaknesses, do we? We don't like to admit that this is a place that we're not doing well. But if we don't, then we don't ever improve or we don't ever change. So part of my sermon today is about some of these things that we can look at. Before all the young ones disappear, I want to tell a story. Who likes stories? One person, three people, four people, five. Good, good, good. People like stories. Okay, I, um, it's one that you might know, but it was one that was out of our devotional. Rich young man came to Jesus. And he said to Jesus, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to have eternal life? Has anyone else asked that question? What do I need to do? And Jesus said, well, you read. Jesus never asked, answered questions straight, didn't he? Didn't make it easy for us. Asked the question with a question. So what does the book that you read say? And he was a learned man and he knew all of the 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 gospel of the um, Moses laws, right? And he said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. This young guy was pretty full of himself. Thought, sweet, that's easy. So who is my neighbor? Because I've only got two neighbors. <laughs> Who is my neighbour? So he was asking that question. And so Jesus told a story. How many of you know this story? Two, three, four. That's good. I'll keep going. <laughs> okay, we can, we can speed it up because most of us do. So the story is a man was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. He got beaten up. He got smacked over. He got whacked in the chops. So bad, so bad that he was on the ground nearly dead. How often does that happen around us where so for no reason somebody just beats somebody up? Okay, so along walks the priest, Pastor Dave. And he walks along and he sees the guy and thinks, hmm, hmm. I feel sorry for that poor guy. Wrong place at the wrong time. It deserves him to be. Anyway, I have to get this sermon ready for the church. And on the way, we're going to be having singing. And if I touch him, then I've got to go and do a whole cleansing process. Uh, so, do you know what? It's going to be easier for everyone and everything if I didn't see him. So, I just look the other way as I walk past and carry on through. Right? Then, along came the second person, priest assistant, Shannon. And a person who worked in the church in the temple. Whew, they should have time. That's their job, isn't it? Go and help people and all the rest of it. But she, she took one look at that person there and went, wow, if I touch him, I'm going to be unclean. I'm female. It's not right. It's not appropriate. And for whatever other reason, she looked at him and thought, hmm, somebody else will do that. And then along came, now I don't know who this person is. Maybe you. This person is generally someone who looked at that person and went there, culturally, uh, not, not, not good. We don't talk to them. So the Samaritans and the Jews. So if we were completely racist, then that person that helped might even be an Aboriginal. You know, like if we're genuinely true, why should I help that? 
So this is the question. So this person was somebody that they really shouldn't help and they went out of their way to help their enemy. So that's the Good Samaritan, right? That's why he's got the name, the Good Samaritan. He had compassion as he walked past. That word jumped out at me like in my heart. He had compassion. Oh, that's going to go bang in that really loud. <laughs> so, my apologies on the camera. How many times did we hear Jesus say, before he did a miracle, and Jesus had compassion on them? And so he went and he did this miracle. And that word, I just went, wow, that's an interesting word. Anyway, I spent a bit of time on that for a purpose. He had compassion. He, he went down. He did what was practical. Washed him, cleaned him, got him ready. First aid level 101, right? In our day, called the ambulance. But in that day, got him on a donkey, took him to an inn. Okay, got him to the hospital. He didn't have private cover and he wasn't covered under Medicare. So he said, look, I'll cover it. I'll cover it because this guy should have had these things, but because of who he is, he's not got it. And so I'll be back tomorrow and just send the bill to me. Okay. And he made sure that the person was okay. And then Jesus went on to ask, so who do you think the neighbour is? And the wise young man said, the person who showed compassion and mercy. The person who showed mercy. So he was saying that the neighbour was the Good Samaritan, the person who saw the need and acted upon it. Really, Jesus was telling us that's the last person who you would call your neighbour. It was a person from a town that you didn't respect, people that were a different culture to who you were. It was a group of people that you would never normally connect up with. And you went out of your way. In fact, you probably even got harassed for doing it. You probably had your other friends going, oh, you did that, you touched him, how did you touch that Samaritan? So he probably had a bit of um, negative consequence in his life as well. So. What do you think of the story? Story is just a story unless we put a little bit of application. As we were doing the 21 days prayer and fasting, that was our day 10. Day 10, I'm reading these things and, and, and the, the whole thing's about everything new. And so the first few days, I've talked to you a bit about some of the things we did. And um, first off, start with a renewed heart. Start with getting rid of the rubbish that's in my heart and bringing that to Christ and starting it clean. And as we went through the whole process of ourselves and God and having right relationship and being in the right place, then when you read these things about how do us as a church, and so in my head, the mission, how do we do these things? How do we do the Good Samaritan? What does that look like for the mission church? Do I ever get compassion? God, I pray that I do not run away when you put that purpose that I'm here for in front of me. I pray that I live up to that. That even when there's excuses and cop-outs, which both the priest and the, and the other person had excuses, I pray that we can be the mission where we can even get our hands dirty, we can be practical, we can do those things. So that was as we moved through. My journey over the two weeks has also been, God, we've become the mission. Okay, there's a bunch of people here, and, and so when we started we had, I don't know, 10 or 15 people. And we were all zealous about, let's go and save the world through mission work. So, uh, Richard and, and Jasmine and mum and dad were there back then. They went down to, to North Perth, sausages, fed the poor in the, in the park. Okay, they started with that. And we attracted a good old um, alcoholic guy, Drew, and a few others. Okay, anyone who was part of the mission, I'll just say the word Drew and look at the smile on their faces. Those who knew Drew. Drew never got rid of his alcohol problem, but we still loved him. We still brought him into the mission. And I say we carefully because I wasn't 100% a part of it, but. I was part and heart. One of Drew's cheeky things, right, um, at North Perth, car park's free, but he'd stand at the door and say, $10 entry. <laughs> so he got his drinking money. <laughs> uh, 
still. Uh, some people were kind enough to give to him because they also knew that's who he was and he'd been, he'd been a drunkard all his life. Unfortunately, Drew didn't make it. But, but the mission learnt in our process, it actually takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of support to look after one alcoholic. It takes a lot of support to look after an ex-druggie. And, and so we sort of went, OK, how do we get bigger? How do we do this better? How do we do more? And so for the next few years, it was more around meals and, and building relationship with people and building connections so that we could teach people or educate people so that, we could, so that they could make the necessary changes in their lives. And our main point of education is to know who God is. So I don't know how many of you read the bulletin, and I don't know how many of you could um, read this to me or memorise this or have even noticed this, but I'm going to read this here um, and see if you even recognise it. This is our mission statement. There we go. So if we don't know what it is, then I've been doing a slack job. And as I read this, ask yourself, is this true of who we are or who we're becoming? Because that's the questions if we're not asking. Um, we don't know. We're just, we're just ignoring things. So we're a growing community of people who are serious about our commitment to God. Agree? Cool. Presenting Christ to all people in action and words. Yeah? Still, still okay? Still sounds like the mission? Doesn't sound like I'm talking about something else? Good, good. We worship God lovingly, serving and encouraging in one another to be like Christ. Okay, that's a tall order, so I'm, you're okay if you just give me half on that. Okay, because we all are trying to do that. We're striving and, and to be like Christ, what a challenge. You know what? To be like Christ is to be in, in Christ and to let him wash all the rest of us away. So we, we teach people that. To be a community of believers that does. Okay, and then our little, our little slogan, small deeds with great love. And we stole that. It's a Mother Teresa thing. Mother Teresa always, always, always. Small deeds with great love. I can only do a little something. I'm only one person. But if I get 10 people doing little somethings, that becomes more powerful. If I get 100 people doing little somethings, that becomes more powerful again. Okay, so the mission operates in an informal way, promoting a relaxed environment in which to discuss God, meet with others, share food, experience, and build friendships. Okay, sound, sound like the mission? Yep, so we've become the mission at this level. My problem is um, humans get into the road, and I'm one of them. Okay, and so this thing about um, building friendships, I find that is really cool. So we build a friendship, and then we blow it up because we're scared to lose it, or whatever. And so for this, for this year, um, I recognise that our weakness has been our ability to communicate and, and also to do conflict resolution. Conflict resolution. Uh, probably a weakness in the church for years and years and years, because if you go to the pastor and say, blah, 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 he's going to defend himself and say, well, we've been working on this for 20 years. Diana's smiling. She's done it before, hasn't she? <laughs> We don't like to see our weaknesses. None of us, okay? Not one person likes to have their weaknesses addressed because it's humbling. Because it might, we might have to address something. Because we might have to make some change. Is there change God's calling in me? And over the past year, I've talked about some of my weaknesses publicly and some of the conflicts that I've had, and that the fact that they've actually not stemmed from the personality or from, from the fact that that person wants to use this or do this or do whatever, and I don't think they should, they've actually stemmed from my pride and from me going, I've got to be right. I'm in control of this. I'm the pastor here, so I've got to have this. This is where it's at. And there's nothing wrong with that until it becomes something that you're not prepared to let go until it becomes something that you uh, force on somebody else or until it starts eating you up. And so I'm really pleased I, I did this 
conflict resolution and, and really pushing it again. Even if you can't do it on the Thursday night, we'll try and find ways that you, can, that you can do that because it all does just helps our communication, how to deal with things, how to talk about things. And if we're on the same page, when you come to me and say, Dave, you know how you said that the other day? Oh, Victoria, are you here? What a shame, what a shame. So a classic, right? I, Victoria came up for prayer one day. That's right, I'm not talking behind her back. She's still out there, she can listen if she wants. And, and she'll be okay with me talking about this, but Victoria came up for prayer one day and she said, can I have all of my pain gone? And I thought, just straight away, the practical person I am, I said, the only way you're gonna have no pain is when you're dead. Very practical, isn't it? Okay, and she looked at me and I said, so do you still want me to pray that prayer? <laughs> Because we've got to be careful with God, we've got to be specific about things. We don't want to just pray a prayer and have them drop dead on us because there's no pain. The only way we're going to have no pain is when we're dead. Now, she didn't realise, and it was loud and there's other music, so she went away and said, Pastor Dave wants me dead. Okay, wasn't my heart, wasn't my intention. I was actually trying to reveal that we do actually need a little bit of pain. Now, fortunately, at that stage, somebody got wind of it and said, now, if that's what you think, I can't imagine Pastor Dave saying that, but you need to go to him and you need to talk about it. Now, if she hadn't told, so she did, she came to me and I said, I am so sorry, Victoria. I couldn't even imagine how horrible that sounded. It wasn't my intention. I was, to, I was trying to say, you're gonna have a bit of pain. We need some pain. I'm not asking for the impossible. I would like your pain in your shoulders to be gone and we'll pray for that. But I know people who don't feel pain and they get blisters on their feet because they didn't even know it was coming. And they struggle to live. And one guy I know, he broke his leg and he kept running because he doesn't feel pain. And it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing. When he goes to the hospital, they can't diagnose what's wrong because he has no pain. Okay, but good intentions. Now, the thing that comes from this is our ability to communicate. Okay, if she hadn't have come to me, I never would have known. I've offended her, but it wasn't my intention. How do we do that better? Okay, so there's two things here. As a recipient, I want, to be, I want to improve. When somebody comes to me and says something, I want to be listening. I want to hear it from their point of view. I want to hear their story. Because straight away, as soon as Victoria comes, I did not say that. How dare you think that? Even you for you to think that. Oh, I don't want to talk to you. Overreaction. No, we've got to learn to listen to what they heard and what they felt and bite your tongue and listen to their side. So, so anyway, these, these, this is the stuff God's been teaching me, okay? And this is what I think is gonna set us apart in the future from just being, um, this is gonna, what is gonna make us the church that Jesus wants us to be because you will know them because, because of their unity. Okay, how many of you remember my pizza sermon? It's a few. So the pizza sermon really quickly goes on, we're all different but we're all necessary. If we have too many chilies, it might not be a very nice pizza, but God gives us the right amounts of people in our church to make a beautiful and perfect tasting pizza. Okay, we are not gonna get on, if, 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 if you're right next to the chili, you're gonna feel a little bit of the heat. Okay, and if your ministry's right next to somebody who's got that chili ministry, you're gonna feel a little bit of the heat. But you've gotta to learn to just work with that. Okay, does that make sense? So God wants unity in the church. He wants us all to be who we are and together with the Holy Spirit, which I, in my illustration I use the cheese, scattered on top of us, the cheese softens it all. Have you noticed? You've got a really hot chili and put a bit of cheese on it, it softens it, it makes it really nice. So the Holy Spirit will fix up all of the things that are too strong or not strong enough and he'll make it blend and he'll make us that church. Jesus goes on to say that we need to be in unity. Okay, we cannot be in unity unless we learn how to, to go through communication and to go through conflict. Conflict is good if it stays in the healthy range. Okay, once we start moving on to either side of conflict, it becomes dangerous and it becomes sinful. As a church, we have been given a tool that the world does not have. Okay, and what I've discovered in this journey is the tool that we've been given is selflessness through Christ. Now the world would turn around and say, and you've probably heard it before, so you're starting to have a conflict. Oh, die, I'm picking on you today. 
because you're in line of sight, you should be sitting with James's. Di, you know, I'm so sad that you've had all those things and that you're in, and you've been fighting with, with whoever it is. And, and you know what? You should take them to court because you deserve it. You know, you're a good person. And that's really wrong of them to do that. Isn't that a common thing to say? Is that what you would hear people saying? And then when you tell your story and something's gone wrong and you can't, somebody else goes, how dare they do that? You need to sue them because you should get your money back and you're in the right. Is that a common thing? Is that what we're hearing? So the information and what we receive from the world is all targeted to please the I, the me. Satan is trying to please me. I was born in sin, so the first thing I want to do is please me. If it hurts me, if it's one of my weaknesses, if it's one of the things I don't like, I get upset. And then I throw a reaction or an overreaction. God said, give all that to me and die to yourself. When we become Christians, we die to ourself and to our selfish nature and the things that we desire. Huh. We die to the things we desire. Sometimes those things are good things. And we've placed them too high. And we've made them more important than what they are. And God says, look, it's more important that you live in unity. Because from unity, the world will know that you are my disciples. And at the moment, I'm feeling that the mission church's weakness is we haven't found the recipe to live in unity. Generalizing, okay? Generalizing. One of my goals would be to educate us in the godly unity. Because it means I'm allowed to go, Pastor Neil, I was really hurt when you said, because, um, and then Neil can come back to me and say, well, you needed to hear that. And I'm sorry, but you did need to hear that. And he, would say, he could say that because he loved me and he could see something that I couldn't see. Or it might be like the case with Victoria and, and when she came to me, I didn't mean it to sound like what you heard. And I can see how she heard it. Okay? And we, can t we, we have good relationships. She didn't run away. She didn't do anything drastic and leave the church and all the things that we do. We get unity in communicating you know, uh, and, and talking with each other. And we need to create that platform. So, so that's the number one thing um, that I feel. The, the number two thing that I feel, I've got five minutes less. The number two thing I feel is, is we need to see compassion. We need that compassion. So when Jesus saw that, that hurting person, he had compassion on them. When the Good Samaritan saw that, he had compassion on it. We need the compassion to come from the Holy Spirit and from Jesus. And then we need to act upon that. And that would make us the mission because we become doers, not, not just hearers. Okay, so that that's, comes back to ties that story in. The third thing is the mission was, was born out of um, the 13th day of our devotions. So isn't that funny? God's just confirmed who we are as, as I've been doing these and asking him for a new vision and a revisioning. Okay, so, so we've been doing this fasting, and this goes... Now, this is the kind of fast I want. I want you to remove sinful chains and tear away the ropes and the burdens and the yoke and set the oppressed and set free the oppressed and break every burdensome yoke. Now, isn't that the role of the church? Isn't that our role? That's what, that's what God wants, okay? That's our fast. I want you to share your food with the hungry and to provide shelter for the homeless and oppressed people. Okay, we'll just ponder on that. When you see someone naked, clothe them. In our society, it might not mean literally naked, it might mean going without or somebody who's, who's got less. Don't turn your back on the, your flesh and blood. Don't leave someone on the side of the road. Good Samaritan. And this is a bit we love. Then your light will shine like the sunrise. Your restoration will, come, will quickly arrive. Your godly behaviour will go before you and the Lord's splendour will be your rear guard. Then when you call out, the Lord will respond. You will cry out and he will reply, Here I am. You must remove the burdensome yoke from among you and stop pointing fingers 
and speaking sinfully. So we've moved back to another challenge, another action on our behalf. You must actively help the hungry and feed the oppressed. He's saying look after each other. And there's another, then. I like these thens. Then your light will dispel the darkness and the darkness will transform, transform into noonday. The Lord will continually lead you. He will feed you even in parched regions. He will give you renewed strength and you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring that continue, continually produces water. The perpetual rains, ruins will be rebuilt. You will re-establish the ancient foundations. You will be called the one who repairs broken walls, the one who makes the streets inhabitable again. And there's one more action that I haven't spent any time on when I've done this in the past. But over this time, God's spoken to me and, and it's something that I need to take a, a bit more seriously and take action on. And as a church and, and, as, a, and as Australian culture, I really think this is something else that, that we need to be moving into. You must observe the Sabbath rather than doing anything you please on my holy day. A lot of people sort of think the Old Testament um, is overridden all that stuff. But God created the, the world and on the seventh day he rested. And he's given that rest to us in the same way that, that we have so much fortune, but he's all he's asking for is us to have a day of rest and to think about him. And the thing that I find is as we observe the Sabbath day, he gives us rest. And we get more done in the other six days. It's a little bit like the tithing. It's a little bit like when we praise him. When we praise him, we, we sacrifice that first feeling, but the, the fruit or the result of it benefits us. So as a church, I'd like to be a little bit more intentional and, and, and please um, and do what God wants on the holy day. You must look forward to the Sabbath and treat the Lord's day with respect. You must treat it with respect by ref refraining from your normal activities and by refraining from your selfish pursuits and from making business deals. And this is actually from the um, NET, New English Translation. Okay, and that's, that's worded quite nicely. You must refrain, so I like that. You must treat it with respect by refraining from your normal activities and refraining from your selfish pursuits and making business deals. And here's another then. So if you like the then, you will do these things. Then you will find the joy in your relationship to the Lord. Who wants the joy back in their relationship to the Lord? Oh, only one or two. Cool. The rest of you don't have to do the Sabbath. <laughs> Find the joy in your relationship to the Lord. I will, and, sorry, I will give you great prosperity. A few more hands will go up this time. Who wants great prosperity? <laughs> I don't think he's just talking about financial prosperity either, guys. I'm not 100% into that name it and claim it, believe it, and it's going to be mine because it's poor doctrine. Prosperity is what God has given us for the eternal. Okay? And you will have great prosperity because he has saved you. He has set you free. He has given you eternal life. How much more can you ask for? Okay? And my experience is God looks after us here as well. So it's another one of those things. Okay? And know for certain that the Lord has spoken. So I was really challenged on that and um, it really touched me as a mission church, one of the things I'd like to, to work on is us um, as individuals and us together, making sure that we put God in the rightful place and that we do give him that day. And in that day, we don't just run to the shops or do the things that we want to do or please ourselves. And as we, as we turn our eyes to Jesus, we turn our hearts to Jesus and we give him that opportunity, he renews us. He gives us joy. He takes away the tiredness. And even in the hardship, he gives us joy that we cannot even understand. Okay? And there's something that God does that's upside down. That in our, in our world, we would say, no, that doesn't work. But in the kingdom, it's because it's the spiritual thing that he's designed us for. 
He will, and you will receive joy, and you will receive prosperity, and that would be spiritual prosperity as well. I'm running out of time. I did have a story, but I'm not going to go there. Um, my challenge, okay, so, so what I came out of in all of this is that we're still the mission. We haven't changed. Um, even though I was thinking things might have changed, we're still going to be a self-funded church that loves each other, that looks after the poor, that does these things. Some of the ways we do these things, Sunshine Tuesday, we reach out to people. The dance schools reaching out to people. The clubs that we run, the home groups that we run, the, the study groups we run are reaching out to, to educate people so that they can know who Christ is, so that they can live in a community, um, a Christian community, where, where there's grace. And if you make a mistake, we need to learn how to give grace when none of us are perfect. Okay, So the thing that we came up with with all of this is God wants us to do more or to be more. To be more was the thing. God wants us to be more. And it's just as well Neil wasn't there, we would have thought we stole a surname. God wants us to be more, and he wants us to be more in prayer. That's one thing I got. He wants us to be more dependent on him. That's the other thing I received. He wants us to be more intentional in doing when we see that, that compassion. When he, he wants us to walk around with our eyes open and not just not see this stuff. So when we see these things and compassion comes upon us, when you have that Holy Spirit say there's something, he wants us to act on it. He wants us to be more as in the mission, the few people who work in the mission, we need to train people up to work and not receive. He wants us to do more because as we do, he heals us and he restores us and he, and he, and he replaces us. Okay? He wants us to do more of looking after the elderly, the people who have served and done so much. He wants us to look after those people. We don't want us to forget about them. He wants us to do more of looking after those who can't and the needy, those who are mute and deaf, those who have disabilities and can't do certain things. He wants us to be their voice or their feet or their arms or whatever they need. He wants us to do more. But probably the key, how do I do more or be more, uh, again comes back to I need to lose a lot of the stuff that's in me that's self. So I just want to go into a time of um, worship. A real season for us to get rid of our self stuff and replace it with God's stuff. Okay? Because the works that come through us are the works of the Holy Spirit. And if we do them in our own strength, we're going to get tired and we're going to burn out and we're going to disappear. We need to do this stuff through His Spirit. We need to be in the, and we need to not be doing this in our own strength. So how do we do that? The only way I've seen is to empty myself of the stuff, the rubbish that I have, the things that are taking up room, that are causing blockages, and to open those areas of my life up to the Holy Spirit and ask him to cleanse me, to set me free of these things. And as we worship, he will set us free. As we pray and give him praise and glory, he will set us free. And God said that he will be setting us free. He will restore our land if we're doing these things. And we're doing these things and it becomes a perpetual thing. You do these things, he sets you free. He sets you free to do these things. Make sense? So thank you for listening. And let's just go into a, a real place of worship. Um, thank you.